if we overemphasize a tool, we do it at the expense of our participants. I learned the hard way that I had been maximizing my digital collaborative tools instead of maximizing the participants of the workshop that I was leading. Hey there, my name is Justin and I have the opportunity of facilitating a lot of CREMA's workshops. Before COVID, we did in-person workshops, obviously, but we also did a lot of remote workshops, digital workshops for distributed teams and clients. Obviously, when COVID happened, we moved exclusively to digital workshops, and now, somewhere nearing the end of COVID, hopefully, we find ourselves doing both digital, in-person, and hybrid workshops. One of the things that we have learned at CREMA, and it's fairly obvious, is that workshops are about people solving problems. So myself as a facilitator, it's my job to equip people to solve problems well. That's by structuring things well, by removing barriers and hindrances to solving the problems, and by helping people come together to make the most of their time. The tricky thing is that when we move workshops from the physical to the digital space, it's easy perhaps for the facilitator to lean too far into the digital space and forget the things that we've learned in the in-person space. And with that, when we move a workshop from the physical space to the digital space, there's a whole new slew of problems that we need to consider and a whole new slew of ways that workshops can go wrong. Perhaps the most obvious learning curve and addition that we need to be thinking about when we're facilitating digital workshops is that you have to dedicate time to addressing technical issues. People not remembering how a trackpad works to do a left versus a right click, for instance, or zooming in and zooming out and trying to remember how to do that. And you have to say, oh, well, think of it like, it, like you're zooming in on a photo on your iPhone, or think of it if you're doing this or that. But it's also about their Wi-Fi connection. Sometimes people cut out and there's nothing you can do about it. There's all kinds of technical concerns that come into play when we're running a virtual workshop. And these things have a significant impact on the productivity and the ability to achieve the goals that you want out of a workshop when you're doing them digitally. There was a workshop that I facilitated a year and a half ago. It was a digital workshop and by the end of the second day, we had spent 16 hours together. There were people that still didn't know how to zoom in and zoom out on our digital collaboration tool. And it's not for lack of training on our parts because indeed we sent a video beforehand, we sent them a link to go through the Miro exercise, click this, click this, it was foolproof. So we really worked hard at training them beforehand and then even during day one. We made sure to, to set up breakout rooms if we needed to, to help one person along the way. But ultimately, because people are using different machines, because people are, have different levels of literacy, we wasted, I'd guess, about three to four hours that could have been uh, wrapped up if we were doing an in-person workshop. And that's just a factor that we need to keep in mind. Another element of difficulty for running a digital workshop is that people find themselves spacing out a lot more. If technology is too far outside of their comfort zones, they find their, some, themselves saying, you know what, I'm just gonna take a seat back and zone out. I'm gonna turn my video off and say, I'll be right back and then they're gonna go do the dishes or whatever it is that you wanna do. And part of that is because it's simply easier to check out. And then another way that digital workshops have a new level of difficulty is that there's an elevation of the voices of the tech literate. In-person workshops, there's all kinds of power dynamics at play. There's posture, there's voice, there's projection, there's energy, there's where you sit at the table, there's how familiar you are with your physical space, not to mention things about race, sexuality, gender, whatever it may be. But in a digital space, there's a new level of hierarchy. The person that knows the shortcuts, that knows the hotkeys, the person that's really efficient with their computer, the person that speaks the language of their computer, they are elevated because they're able to be more articulate. They're able to visually communicate their ideas far easier. It's easier for them to say, you know what, let me just quickly draw up this in a little wireframe. They go to the wireframe library, they add some icons, they add some emojis, they draw some arrows, and everyone at the table, or the digital table, will say, oh, that makes sense. Whereas the person who may not be as tech literate simply can say, here's my idea, here's what my suggestion is, and people might nod and smile and say, okay, thanks for sharing but their level, the, the, the playing fields are totally off. In a digital workshop, it's much harder to level that playing field as opposed to being in an in-person workshop where you can limit those things at least a little bit more. And of course, there's several other ways that digital workshops have different nuances and new problems to flesh out. 
but ultimately, it's easy to say, as long as I use the right digital tool, everything will be fine. As long as I learn the tool, the workshop will go swimmingly. And that's simply not the case. If we overemphasize a tool, we do it at the expense of our participants. I learned the hard way that I had been maximizing my digital collaborative tools instead of maximizing the participants of the workshop that I was leading. One of the ways that I knew that I was doing that was there was a time where we sent out a survey after, after running a five-day design sprint with a client. And I asked for all kinds of feedback, what went well, what didn't, how could I improve, what exercises were most valuable, least valuable, et cetera. And one of the most common themes that I heard them say was, wow, y'all's use of the digital tool was amazing. This digital tool was great. The digital tool, the digital tool, the digital tool. Now, it's not to say that I don't want some encouragement about the, digi the digital tool, because the digital tool is integral for the success of a remote workshop. So they should mention that was really efficient, that was really cool, we're really intrigued by it. But the fact that they focus most on the tool and didn't mention the way that we solved the problem and the problem that we solved and what the tool enabled them to do was problematic for me. In other words, they were communicating the symptoms of the fact that the tool was to them the means in and of itself, not the means to the end of problem solving. And it's in that that we started rethinking the way that we were using digital tools. Also attending workshops and boot camps by other industry leaders, we learned that we needed to rethink the way that we were doing digital workshops. So in response to all of this, we sat down and we reevaluated our tools, our digital processes, our agendas, um, all of our collaborative efforts and feedback from clients. And what we did was we came away with three key elements that had to be considered in the relationship to each other. Those things are the problem, the tool, and the process. Those three things make up what we call the workshop capacity triangle. A facilitator brings people together to solve problems, whether that problem is we need to refine our brand, we need to decrease the bounce rate, we need to increase conversion, we need to increase Q4 sales, we need to rethink our strategic initiatives for these things. People get together to solve problems. So this is why the team is there. And when the facilitator crafts the agenda, every single element of the workshop should be working towards getting at that goal. The process itself is that agenda, is the, the flow that the facilitator is going to take participants through. A, B, C, D, E. And a process is either as complex or as simple as the time allowed often. So for instance, a simple one hour workshop or a one hour meeting might be, we meet and gather, have some small talk, have an icebreaker if needed, address the problem, deal with what needs to be dealt with, come up with next steps, leave. That's a very simple process. A longer process, however, say not just three hours, but six hours, eight hours, three days, four days, two weeks, three weeks, we've ran those long of workshops with our clients. And as the time is that long, so the process has to be far more complex. People shouldn't be focusing too much on a process while they're meeting. People should be able to sit and focus fully on the problem they're trying to solve and not be as concerned about how they're going to get from there to there. So we've talked about the problem, why people are there, the process, how we're getting them to solve the problem. Now let's talk about the tool. When you're in an in-person workshop, traditionally tools are fairly common. Sticky notes, Sharpies, you write down, it makes sense. Great, but when you move into a digital space, tools become a very confusing thing. People that aren't familiar with the tools, people that don't know shortcuts, that they've never been in any program where V switches to cursor, N switches to new, C converts or makes it a comment, anything like that. It can be really overwhelming. There's very, very little mental bandwidth that a participant is using when an in-person workshop focusing on the tool. But man, when you move digital, it can be all consuming. So having defined these three elements, problem, process, and tool, let's put all three of those on their own axis on a triangle. This is the workshop capacity triangle. When we increase one, we necessarily decrease the other. And when we look at this, it's important to know that the scale here is the bandwidth that a participant has. It is their mental capacity for each one of these elements. So let's take an in-person workshop, for instance. 
if we start out at 100% with the, with the problem, people are wanting to spend 100% of their bandwidth on solving this thing. Well, the tool is not gonna take much bandwidth at all for them. It's gonna take maybe like two and a half percent, if that. So let's just call that zero. The process may be a little bit difficult. People may not be familiar with the process. It may be a little bit lengthy or, or winding or take a couple of days and they may be not familiar with it. So let's say hypothetically, it takes like 5% of their bandwidth. 95% of their bandwidth is focused on solving the problem. This is great, this is ideal. Now let's move it to maybe a more complex in-person workshop, a more complex thing like a design sprint. If someone has never run a design sprint, all of a sudden they're using tools in a different way. They're wondering, okay, do I hold the sticky note this way or this way? How many pieces of paper do I use? How do I fold this thing for this exercise? Do I draw the lines, do I not? It's so maybe 10% on tools. And then let's say 15% on process because it's multi-day, there's maybe some confusion trying to figure out what to do. Then we've got 25% total, which means we've got 75% to focus on the problem. And this is still pretty good. And as you do design sprints with the team more and more, they're more familiar and so they can focus more time or more uh, bandwidth on the problem. Where it gets difficult, obviously, is when we move to digital workshops. Because even a basic digital workshop, we still keep 15% for that process because it's a new process but now we increase the tool from maybe five percent to 10 to 20 to 25 all of a sudden people are not able to focus on the problem they're trying to solve and it should be self-explanatory the more you focus on the tool the less you focus on a problem but i found that this visualization really helps facilitators see that even just a little increase in emphasis on tool significantly decreases the amount that participants can focus on the problem imagine then when you get to advanced digital workshops where you have interconnected elements and you have hyperlinks that do this and you have dotted lines and this and this and this. What's advanced for you as a facilitator may be out of this world advanced for your participants. And so things that are basic for me might be advanced for others depending on their tech literacy. So let's say a, a, an advanced digital workshop, all of a sudden people are only able to spend like 50% of their capacity on the problem, if that. And this is not even including like switching costs. Switching costs, the, the mental break of saying, I was learning a tool, but now I'm trying to focus on the problem, but now I'm confused about this. So none of this is, is a science. It's much more of an art, but it's important to see the relationship between the three anyway. And while we're at it, this is why Crema does not train as we facilitate. We've had clients come to us saying, hey, could you facilitate a, a design sprint for us? And could you teach us how to facilitate a design sprint? So kind of we spend a week together, you help us solve the problem and you teach us kind of how to solve these problems ourselves. We'd say, no, that, that is 50% of your time on tool, 50% of your time on process, that leaves 0% for you to solve a problem. You're gonna walk away having not solved a problem because you're too busy trying to learn how to do these things that we've refined for years and years. But ultimately, the point stands that if you want people to focus on the problem, you must minimize the emphasis that they're putting on tool and process. As I mentioned, this is not necessarily a hard and fast mathematical rule. These axes are, are, are not um, perfectly mathematically calculated. It's more just showing the inverse relationship. So to make it a little bit more qualitative, you can find in the YouTube description, a virtual workshop collaboration assessment. And this is a simple check the boxes, add five points for every box you check, and then look at your final total. So what does that practically mean? Practically, this means that we facilitate workshops differently for different clients. If our clients are more tech literate, if they end up in that 80 to 100 range, then I'm going to build the workshop much more for a collaborative experience. If they're lower, I'm going to intentionally craft a workshop to be more analog. Some simple examples of what this looks like practically. I will say, I want everybody to write down on paper the, a two sentence summary of why we're here today or a two sentence summary of what you hope to accomplish in the next two weeks. And I will ask them, I'll go around and I'll ask them to share it and I will type it out as they're doing it. That's how I would use it as a presentation tool, not a collaboration tool. I will be sharing my screen. They will be watching me and Miro the whole time, but they're not going to be jumping in. Or as I mentioned with um, collaborate with caution, I might say, I'm gonna send one person this link. I'm gonna keep sharing my screen, but jump in, edit this, type this in. We're gonna all take a look together. But again, this is collaborating with caution. So that's, that's an important distinction to say that I'm going to construct workshops differently for different types of clients. Now, I do wanna be clear that this is not something that is unique to Crema or unique to Justin. We are not the first people in the world to say that you should build workshops different for each client. Of course not, that's obvious. Nor are we the first people to say, attention, attention, digital workshops are different from in-person workshops. Like, duh, everybody knows that. But this framework should help us evaluate in a new way and help equip ourselves to make better decisions. 
But I do want to share some of the things that other facilitators and industry leaders are doing. We were on a boot camp with Jake Knapp, who, um, along with John Zaratsky, wrote the Design Sprint book. And one of the things that he did was he wrote things out by hand. So he used an iPad and he said, I want everybody to write it out analog in front of you. And then we'll share it with him. He wrote it in Miro by hand so that you could see it. And this is a way of forcing it not to be about the tool. You're watching his handwriting as he's writing it. He's detecting the tool. Another thing, and this is uh, something that Douglas Ferguson at Voltage Control, a huge industry leader in facilitation and problem solving, did. I'm gonna show you here what Douglas calls the two canvas system. This is a redacted design sprint that we've done, redacted in that I removed all the information from it so you can't see who it is. But what we have is we had this activity board and then this is the design sprint board. The activity board was a totally separate URL and it was the only URL that clients had access to. So we sent this out and we had our goal, we had references, we had a parking lot, and we had an individual space for each individual person there. And so we would pre-populate their space with all the stickies, dots, et cetera, that they needed. And we would bring over elements. So if, if I were to highlight this, copy it, and paste it, it'll fit perfectly right in here. And the agenda was right here. But this way we would say, all right, we're gonna focus on the can we's, drag this over here. This way people aren't confused by all of these inter all these lines and dots. And this is a very visually overwhelming thing, not to mention their technology. They may be saying, or they may open it up and it may take their computer like literally two to five minutes to load up this or to make any edits on it because there's just a lot going on, especially when we had the images included, when there's sketches, when there's links, videos, PDFs, et cetera. So the two canvas system, having your full board of all your exercises as a little uh, pantry that you could just paste in whatever's relevant to the activity board and then replace it, bring it back, put the new one on, bring it back, put the new one on. So Douglas Ferguson and Voltage Control, they really helped me and they really refined my understanding uh, of how we can detect workshops. So I'm gonna wrap up with a quote from Adam Kahane. It's a quote from his book, Facilitating Breakthrough, How to Remove Obstacles, Bridge Differences, and Move Forward Together. He says this, he says, the essence of transformative facilitation is not getting participants to work together, but helping them remove obstacles to doing so. You can't push a stream to flow, but if you remove the blockages, it will flow by itself. So that's the heart of this framework, and that's my heart for this framework. It's not about what Miro or Mural can or cannot do. It's not about what people are able to do or able to not do, or what technology is most important with doing those things. It's about removing blockages. It is our humble charge as facilitators to enter into a space and to help people become better versions of themselves, to bring their full selves to a meeting, to solve problems like they haven't before, to walk away feeling unlocked, motivated, energized, and, and reignited with passion for the things they're working on. And it's our job to remove anything that gets in the way of that. That's not to say that Miro boards can't be extravagant and, and, and full of amazing features. It's not to say that your boards can't be beautiful and quirky and fun and have really silly icebreakers or really nuanced uh, interactions with different elements. But it is to say that if that's happening at the expense of people solving problems, then we've missed the mark. Thanks so much for watching, y'all. If you enjoyed this video, then please give us a thumbs up. And if there's anything that you, you didn't like or, or questions that you have, frustrations that you have, points that you wanna clarify or have questions about, please drop it in the comments. We really wanna answer your questions and engage with you. That's how we learn and that's how we can grow together. So please drop us a comment and, uh, and let's learn together. And if you haven't already subscribed, please click the subscribe button and click that little bell that shows up so you can get notified every time we have a new video because we've got some awesome content and we can't wait for you to see it. See you next time.